He was a great believer in uh, putting people off balance to get the truth. Jimmy used to hang at our house a lot and came and went. My mother said like he was just another son, but he wasn't going to meet with George Stevens two on one. He was going to distract them. He had a plan. He always had a plan. Let's hear more from Lou Bracker. To give you a, a picture of Jimmy, more, more of a picture of Jimmy. Jimmy, with his curiosity, would talk like in Salinas to vegetable growers, in Texas to ranchers, and he would use that stuff. In East of Eden, one of the famous scenes is the bean field, where Jimmy is urging the beans to grow faster. That he got from the farmers, try and urge with their with their will and their hands, the crops to grow faster because the market was good. In Giant, there's a scene where Jimmy is staking off the property that the Mercedes McCambridge character had willed him. He's stepping it off. He got that from the ranchers. That's what they did. That's how they measured their property, by stepping it off. So he always had a purpose. Then he learned from the Wranglers how to twirl a rope, and he used that rope in Giant in his uh, one scene with Rock Hudson. He, he was smart, very smart. Before Giant, and before Jimmy had committed to Giant, George Stevens, in his you know, attempt to get Jimmy committed to the movie, set up a lunch in the green room, which is, was the commissary at Warner's. Jimmy called me at the office and said, uh, could you make it out here for lunch? So I said, uh, sure, why not? That's all he said, as usual. So I get there. They're in a booth, Jimmy, and across from him, George Stevens and the producer of Giant. Jimmy introduces me by name, and that's it. And I sit there, and, and Jimmy knew that I would, this is the way I would be, that I'd pick up right away. Jimmy told him absolutely nothing about me, but he wasn't going to meet with George Stevens two-on-one. He was going to distract them. He was playing a game, really, with them. Every time they would ask him a question or did he have a problem with Giant or this, he'd look at me, but he wouldn't say anything. So they didn't know whether I was his confidant, his agent, or they didn't know who I was, <laughs> which in Hollywood is very disconcerting. Throughout that whole lunch, I never said a word. Jimmy looked at me. They kept looking at me. They didn't know who to talk to. And that's exactly the way Jimmy wanted that lunch to go. I love that that sense of, like you've talked about uh, in the book and today where he always he always knew how to have control of the situation pretty much just like that. Yes, he was very very good at that. <laughs> Another instance, one night my cousin Adele married to Lenny Rosamond, Lois Smith and Jimmy came up to the house for coffee and my mom's baking prior to going to an acting class to just observe it. So Jimmy said, come, come with us. And I said, I, I'm not, I'd rather go to a movie. I'm not, I'm not interested in sitting in an acting class. Anyway, the, with Lenny and Lois, and they, they talked me, and, all right, I'll go. We walk in there creates a little excitement because they knew who Jimmy was. They know who Lois was, you know, working stars from the New York stage. And I'm there with my black leather jacket. And of course they assume I'm another New York actor. Anyway, we go through this class and everybody's leaving and the leader of the class asked Jimmy if he's interested in, you know, 
attending the classes. And Jimmy says, no, not right now. And so he turns to me and asks me, <laughs> I'm like, I'm, uh, just exactly what Jimmy wanted, <laughs> the distraction. Uh, and uh, of course I said no, and we left. It's just another incident where Jimmy controls the situation. He was a director of life. <laughs> yeah, he um, he was a great believer in uh, putting people off balance to get the truth. <laughs> Everybody thought I had a duster? Before we leave, we ought to talk about the giant situation. Jimmy used to hang at our house a lot and came and went. My mother said like he was just another son. <laughs> he would come and go and show up. Sometimes on weekends, he'd spend an entire day there at around the pool. Jimmy had a, always told me or told the interviewers, you can't teach someone to act. That's what he had against the actor's studio. You become the character or you, or you don't. On Giant, there were uh, George Stevens was old Hollywood and, uh, and thought that, like Hitchcock, that actors are children and should be treated as such, told what to do. And Jimmy did not want to be told how to act. And George Stevens' uh, old Hollywood gimmick called him on the set and don't use him. Uh, just have him sit there all day. Well, finally, Jimmy had enough of that and disappeared on a Friday. Where did he disappear? To our house. Because <laughs> nobody would have thought or had it had the telephone number or anything else. He had a plan. He always had a plan. Uh, he was going to disappear and until they agreed to a meeting and, uh, and hashed everything out. And my folks were in on it, uh, uh, that if anybody did think to call the house, nobody knew anything about Jimmy. But Jimmy was at the house and relaxed, hanging around the pool, uh, like he didn't, nothing was going on. Meanwhile, Warners was frantic. They were searching high and low for Jimmy. Dick Clayton was searching high and low for Jimmy. But nobody called the house. And finally, that Sunday, Jimmy had decided that it was time. And he contacted, I think, uh, Dick Clayton to tell Warners that he would, he would not come back until there was a meeting between he and Jack Warner and the studio execs and George Stevens about how he was to be treated. You were his closest friend, and, and you've shared how there's been over... 200 books and as well as many documentaries made about James Dean and and none of them have presented him as as human or realistic or as truthfully as your book does because you were his closest friend and you were there like you said and it just really warms my heart to think of how you each found each other when you did and and everything you've experienced thinking about your book now it's it's been almost 10 years since it was published I saw and I'd love to know your thoughts on this would you ever want to see your book adapted into a film that presented your friendship with James as truthfully as you've written, or would you rather that not happen? Oh, I, you know, I really don't have an opinion. Uh, it, w it wouldn't bother me. Uh, might bother me if they butchered it, but uh, oh, yeah, no, no butchering. False, uh, 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 stuff, but uh, like, like most of the books that have been written about him, but um, it wouldn't it wouldn't bother me. But now I'll tell you one other little story. I I might as well I put it in the book. One night, Jimmy and I were at his place in Sherman Oaks, which was about five minutes or so down from where we were. We lived. We we're sitting in his kitchen, which he never does because I don't think Jimmy could boil water. <laughs> And we're talking about, you know, the great mysteries of life, one of which, can you have sex in a Porsche Speedster? And 
which is a very small car. <laughs> and we can't come to a conclusion there. We're tossing it around. <laughs> anyway, a few days, a few nights later, Jimmy swings up to the house at night, like 10 o'clock at night, which is not unusual. He doesn't get out of the car. My mother comes to the front door and Jimmy yells, uh, you know, is Lou there? Is Lou home? And my mom says, no, I, I think he went to a movie. And he had this girl with him. And I asked my mother, who was the girl? And she said, I don't know. She had dark hair, small. And at any rate, she asked Jimmy, do you have a, do you want to leave a message for him? And Jimmy said, yeah, tell him the answer is yes. Referring to our conversation about the Porsche. Yes. And having <laughs> sex in the Porsche. The girl with him was Natalie. So you draw your own conclusion. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking with me. I, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to do that and, and share your stories with us. And uh, just, yeah, thank you so much. You've lived such an amazing life and you're an amazing person. And I really am glad that uh, that your daughters talked you into it. <laughs> hey, hey, it's all over. The rest is history, as they say. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Everyone, make sure to buy Jimmy and Me, a personal memoir of a great friendship, which you can get anytime on Amazon. If you enjoy books on actors and filmmaking, you won't be disappointed because this one is one of the best. Thank you for watching the Burbank International Film Festival's Real Conversations. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. And also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And learn everything you need to know about the festival at BurbankFilmFest.org. Before you go, stick around and see other videos we have to offer, like these two. Hmm. See you next time. <laughs>